Welcome back to the bike lane. It's good to be with you once again and coming to you from North Side Wheelers. We've just returned from the Tour de France and there is a lot to talk about. Wade, Scott, you both look suntan. The weather in Melbourne is a little bit cool though. He's got makeup on. Mine's a tan. His is makeup. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the Tour de France, the key fallout from it, particularly the drug issue. Stuart O'Grady, Eric Zabel, etc. We're going to speak to Richie Port about what happened at Team Sky, how they won, and can he win the Giro d'Italia next year? And with an Australian bias, Cadell Evans BMC Racing, how did that all go for them? Plus, the Women's Tour de France. Should it or should it not happen? And we'll catch up with Liz Heppel, who rode it back in the 80s and even finished in third place. Plus, we'll take a look at what we're looking forward to for the rest of the season. Let's get stuck into it. Not surprisingly, the Tour de France was marred with doping but not the 2013 Tour de France. It was the 1998 Tour de France once again rearing its ugly head. And we've seen a whole list of cyclists being named. Stuart O'Grady was amongst them, Eric Zabel, and so too was Laurent Jalabert. And a lot of people have been complaining about the fact that, well, there have been partial confessions. So to get a little bit more of a perspective on human nature and why partial confessions happen, earlier on this week, Wade Wallace caught up with Dr Justin Colston to get his view on why that happens. There's a psychological principle called the minimal sufficiency principle and, and it really is nicely encapsulated by exactly what uh, we're talking about here. It's where somebody looks at a situation and decides that going all the way might not be necessary to get the outcome that they want, so therefore they don't go all the way. Um, they, they do what's minimally sufficient. And the reason that they do this is because the costs are lower and there's less pain. Now, obviously, we've seen that happen, as, you, as, as you've mentioned, with Eric Zabel. Um, we don't know yet whether there's more to hear about Stuart O'Grady, but if there is, there's long-term pain still in it for him if, if, if there's going to be more of a confession. The issue is, though, right now, everybody thinks that they can get away with what's minimally sufficient, and so that's what they go for because, obviously, it simply doesn't hurt as much. The challenge with lying, though, is this. Once a person tells a lie, and they get away with it. That's, that's actually the best time to come out and say, you know what, I did lie. But they never do because they feel okay about things. They feel like everything's under control. And over time, they're, they're, they're now up to the ante. So the whole team expects a lot more from them. The fans expect more from them. Everybody buys what they're selling. And so they keep it going until all of a sudden they've built an entire team around them and, and fans and everyone who sees them as a hero. And I think with Stuart O'Grady, we've got a great example where in the press in the last couple of weeks we've had Mike Tonelara saying, come on, Stuart's had a great career. Don't judge him because of one mistake. And guys like Lee Howard saying, I don't care what you say, he's always going to be my hero. Um, over time, of course, this can, this can really hurt because when he does have to come clean, the costs are high. There's so many people that have believed in him. There's so much money at stake. All the fans uh, and, and all the support network, everything around it is, is getting harder and harder and harder to, you know, to make somebody uh, feel like they want to confess. And again, that's why they go for the minimal confession, the minimal sufficiency principle, because they're hoping to minimise the cost in doing that. Well, Justin Colson, who appears regularly on the project, he's always keen to put his opinion forward and makes a fair bit of sense in terms of you try and minimise the damage, mm. which makes sense. Yeah, the, the costs are really high right now. And I, I, I could understand why the minimal confession is what people would do. And, and what Justin says makes a lot of sense. So. so let's take a look at a few of the writers who did, didn't confess. They were caught. They did not confess. Stuart O'Grady was one of them. Eric Zabel was another. Jackie Durant and also Lauren Jalabert and they all handled it quite differently. Stuart O'Grady came out with the, I only used it once, and that was the time that he was caught. I do not believe Stuart O'Grady. The evidence, not the evidence, but the, the common sense says that it probably shouldn't be believed, um, and that's not the way I would have handled it though, with him, but here, sitting here, how can I really say that honestly? This has been a really tricky one for me because Stewie is a, a friend of mine and I don't want to criticise him regardless of the rights and the wrongs that have happened and, and you know, you criticise people when they have done wrong and he has, obviously. I know that, uh, that obviously 98 was the Festina affair, writers were going to jail, TVM as well, they were delivered back from jail I think at three in the morning or so, yeah. there was a sit down thing and uh, I do believe that Stewie 
saw things differently after that because of the jail terms and possible jail terms that were happening. Um, so look, maybe it was the only time he, he did it, but we know from Eric Zabel, he was caught in 96. Yeah, so Zabel confessed to 96 and he said that's the only time I did it, as O'Grady has said about 98, and now it comes out that he was caught in 98 as well. If he had have had a complete confession in 96, he would still have his job at Katusha and he wouldn't have to explain it to his son again. And the first, the confession was actually a lie. That's the, the, the unfortunate was part, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he's had to go through this twice, yeah. unnecessarily. Yeah, and then by contrast, you've got Jackie Durant, who's a commentator on French Eurosport, who caught, confessed to the whole lot, beyond what he was caught for, and said, don't cast dispersions upon the current generation because of our bullshit generation. They were his words. I thought he handled it well. And he has a bit to lose because a lot of commentators have been getting the sack because of their confessions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's look, and also if you look at Stewie's situation here in Australia, he's copped an enormous amount of criticism, deservedly so. But I think it's also difficult for anybody else that may have been thinking of confessing because they've seen what's happened to Stewie and his reputation is completely shot. Which I think we're also being judged, or the writers are being judged on today's standards from what happened yesterday. And there's no yeah. certain no way of justifying that but things have really moved on and we're so much harsher now on anybody that takes the cheating option. So how would you advise somebody to handle it? Because you've got the Matt White example who was caught for a specific period with the USADA report and he said, well, actually, hang on, there was that period, but the one before and the one after as well. So there's nothing in the closet for Matt White. Mm -hmm. So he can go back on. If O'Grady isn't telling the truth and there's something else in the closet that does come out, then he's in real trouble. Yeah. So yeah. if you're advising Stuart O'Grady, at the end of this year's Tour de France, knowing this was about to happen, what would have you said? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the Eric Zabel thing hadn't come out by at that point, um, but you kind of know what's going to happen. I, I, I believe I th you can predict that, it just, just make a clean confession uh, and everything. And that, that's, uh, I can't assume that what he's saying is a lie, though. No. You, you, would, you, would you put two and two together, right? And, and it is, but yeah, it's, it's... Well, in a tweet earlier on today, Ben Knapp came out with saying what he wants to see this year is the full truth from Stuart O'Grady. Mm. And that's the underlying tone. So from a PR, from a management perspective of a brand, of a reputation, I think it's going to tarnish him more if people don't believe him than if he had have come out more extensively and told us his full story. Because yeah. he actually has an obligation, I believe, to tell his full story, given the position he took on the AOC with the Australian Olympic Commission, the position that he held as a leader within Australian cycling, not just at Orica Greenwich, but within Australian cycling. Chosen or thrust upon him, he was a leader. And he's had a lot of positive media coverage throughout his mm. career. And, and that's great, and he would have accepted that graciously, and, and it made Stuart O'Grady, right? And it, plus winning races, obviously, that's why I got it. But this isn't going to be positive for him, and he's got to take that with yeah. the, the good with the bad. And I want to make this clear, I have empathy for all of them. And if I was in O'Grady's position, I can understand why he took EPO in 98, understanding that environment somewhat from a fair distance. I can also understand why in January he didn't tell the truth when he was asked by Nicky Vance. Based on what we heard from Justin earlier on, why would you? It's mm. human nature. But once caught, then it's a different scenario. Mm. So taking the riders out of it, what should the UCI do? There's been a lot of talk about amnesty. Amnesty reduces that cost, doesn't it? Um, there has to be some incentive as well, but amnesty, it just takes a s small critical mass of people coming forward. I, and, and that cost isn't so great, but right now the cost is lose your career, lose absolutely everything, your, your Hall of Fame status, everything. Percentage is not above 90% of anyone that's you know, been involved in a, in a high level of cycling since they've retired or are still involved like Stuart O'Grady. They've lost almost everything when they've yeah. confessed. So mm. there's no incentive for anyone right now to come out and start. No, there's, there's not. And Orica Green Edge are supporting Stuart O'Grady. Mm. So we haven't solved anything. Let's agree on that. We haven't solved a thing. But maybe you can help us. So if you're advising one of these athletes, what advice would you give them on a confession? And do you think Orica Green Edge have done the right thing in continuing to support Stuart O'Grady? Next up, we're going to talk actually about the racing at the Tour de France. Well, the tour has been run and won convincingly by Chris Froome. Let's take a look at a few of the highlights, a few of the lowlights, and assess a couple of the key battles. Why don't we start with a negative and go with the biggest disappointment? Because that normally gets a bit of conversation going. For me, the biggest disappointment was the fact that for the non-cycling purists, which excludes us and excludes most of you, this was a boring Tour de France. Because the battle for yellow, effectively, for those just watching the sport casually, was sewn up in most people's mind after stage eight. 
So therefore, the people that tune into the radio news, watch it on six o'clock news, they thought the race was over early. And it was effectively. But for those of us close to it, we loved seeing Kittle get the better of Cavendish. We loved the crosswind stage on 13. There was a lot for us to like. Yeah. There's so many stories within that race. But to get new people into the sport, it was boring. It's interesting, isn't it? But look, I don't disagree with you because the time gap at the end does indicate that. But if you compare it to last year's tour where Team Sky was, was more so boring. dominant. Yeah, and look, it was more like Formula One last yeah. year where it was perfection the way they delivered yeah. Wiggins to the victory. This year... So Mark Webber finished fourth last year, did he? He was. He, was, yeah. he didn't crash in the first <laughs> corner. But there was the time gap for sure at the end, but it just seemed like every, you know, every time there was some decisive moments or every other decisive moment, Team Sky didn't look quite as strong as they were the year before. You know, You're we hard had, to disappoint at a bike He race. didn't go unchallenged. He, he looked like he was going to come unhinged so often. He was so strong that he didn't, but the chance was always there, I thought. But Chris Froome yeah. looks like he might come unhinged in the neutral zone. He just got that gangly oh, yeah. style. He looks <laughs> he uncomfortable. Did. Stage one. He, he was he the crashed. first guy to crash <laughs> and then he wins. <laughs> yeah. But your biggest disappointment? I got to admit, TJ was my biggest disappointment. Not because you know he, he had a disappointing tour, which what he did, but I was I found myself secretly you know cheering for him every every single stage, hoping yeah. he was going to do well because I did say he was overrated, but I really want him to do well because I think he is uh, has a great future. But he's just like a lot of these these guys who have a, a brilliant tour to France and then they go down for a little while yeah. and then they come up. So he's got a lot of potential. But I'm going to completely disagree with you, in that I thought he was brilliant. He did. Yeah. Physically, TJ Van Garden was ordinary. And he performed below expectations in the first week. It was really disappointing. But he showed character. He That's showed the way. sort of persistence that will have him a contender in the future in the Tour de France. He got in breakaways. He finished 10th in the time trial. He showed that he can respond to a knockback. I thought he was fabulous. He didn't just spit the dummy, did he? No, there was no toys going out of the cot. I thought he was no. good. Alp Duez was phenomenal on his part. I, I got to give him that. Yeah. Mm. So... Have you got a disappointment? Are you uh, ever disappointed at a bike race? No, I love sport and I love cycling. Look, I'd have to say, uh, unfortunately, Cadell, Cadell Evans. Yeah. Um, you know, we thought after the Giro d'Italia that, I actually thought going into the Giro that that was BMC's ploy to get something out of Cadell because they weren't sure, they weren't convinced he was going to get a good result at the Tour de France. They got a good one out of him at the Giro d'Italia by finishing on the podium. But then that was a step too far to go to the tour, and, and unfortunately, I think he's uh, he's gone over the crest of the wave. Okay, well, <laughs> we <laughs> say that every time yeah. we talk about Cadell. He's yeah, but <laughs> at the tour, yeah, over yeah, the crest yeah. of the tour wave. <laughs> but he might win the Giro next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, but he's, no, done. he's done. He's done. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at next year. And credit to you as well. I laughed at Scott McGrory when he said that Rodriguez would finish. Did you say second? I said second. Yes. Oh, well, you no. were wrong. He finished third. Yeah. But he <laughs> performed better than I, I thought he would because I, there were two time trials. And how good was he in the second time trial? First time trial, short one. Certainly a He lost three minutes and 20 yep. seconds or second something. Second time trial, two category two climbs around the same distance as well. Didn't lose much there. He lost about 10 or 12 seconds. I never thought he was going to beat Froome. I didn't think anyone was going to beat yeah. Froome. But I just looked at who was going to be his competition. He was going to be racing Contador and um, Valverde and these riders. Yeah. And in the second time trial, I thought he would be good. And then just those uh, last few up on stage, I thought he was right himself And then the cigar on the final stage. Yeah. Love yeah. him. He is one of the joys to cover in the sport. Yeah. So early predictions for next year. I want to see... Froome, is Froome the favourite for next year's Tour de France? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, put the money on him now, for sure, unless something happens. Look, Bradley Wiggins might come back. Who knows what's going to happen with him? But uh, I'm really looking forward to the Colombians. I want to see the Colombians yeah. en masse come yeah. to the Tour de France next year. Uran riding for Amiga, riding yeah. against Chris Froome. But he Frank won't have Bitsy. a team. We'll talk about Cavendish in a moment. Mm. Katowski. Katowski is uh, looking good for, to, to support Uran. Yeah, yeah. But they've yeah. also be working for, for Cavendish. Yeah, for so Cal highlights from this year. Yeah. Nadal Quintana has to be a highlight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, great story. Yeah. yeah, he was fabulous. So looking to, to next year, I see Froome and Quintana on the podium again. Mm. What about Andrew Talansky? Not yeah. for me, not, not on the podium. Can he get top five next year? Squeezed into the top ten this year? He might be another one of those ones who had a shining tour and then we won't see for a little while. And I just see it happen again and again. But he is awesome. I think Talansky's great. Okay, so... Froome is the favourite for next year. Quintana, second favourite for now. Let's see how it develops. And yeah. Rodriguez, no, not going to happen. N uh, Nibali will come back. Nibali will yeah, come Nibali. back. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the sprinters. We predicted, all I did, stupidly, that Cavendish could potentially win seven stages. But if you look at the results, I was actually right. Because Kittel won four, Cavendish won two, and Greipel won one. 
So that's seven stages won by one of the pure sprinters. Who's the world's best sprinter, Mark Cavendish or Marcel Kittel? Kittel. <coughs> Cavendish. Right now, right now Kittel is. I say Cavendish. Mm. Now, uh, the reason I say Kittel is if you look at, obviously, 25 Tour de France stages won by Mark Cavendish, <coughs> he's been the best sprinter over the last five years. But right now, head to head, in pure sprint races and sprint stages, Kittel overwhelmingly has been the better of Cavendish. Mm. I say it's still Cavendish because he was tired at the Tour. Everybody talks mm. about the GC and you can't do the Giro and then the Tour. Well, Cav did the Giro and then the Tour. I thought he was tired at this year's mm. Tour and that was the difference. Mm. But I really enjoyed Marcel Kittel and his haircut. <laughs> That's right. So did Kunda Court. He had to yeah, get the same. He did. Look, Cavendish will have to change his training. If he continues the same way as he has been the last few years, riding virtually on, on natural ability. He's got an incredible amount of He's guts of that. and determination, for sure. And he trains very, very hard. And all sprinters, all cyclists at that level do. But I know that uh, you know, he trains incredibly hard. And Rob Hales, who takes him motor pacing, says often he'll sit behind Cavendish and let Cavendish go to the front because he just wants to go 10, 15, the, 20 kilometres. Because the best kilometers. can't keep up. No, he just wants to ride along at 40 kilometres per hour. Yeah. Okay. So he needs to change his training and, and do more specific have, sprint training. He's going to have Mark Renshaw next to him too next year. He so. is, which mm. is great. Another mm. one, best domestic. This is a conversation that we had a bit on and off throughout the race. Mm. Best domestic. Most people are going with Richie Port. I'm going with Roman Kreuzinger. I thought he was clearly the best domestic in the race. Yeah. And I can't believe you would argue against me, but you will, I'm sure. I will. Because <laughs> there was points where he was racing for the podium. This guy was in third place overall, and he was laying it down on the line for Contador. And I would argue that he was stronger than Contador. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, so sure. he sacrificed yeah. more than anybody else. Yeah. Richie Port didn't sacrifice any personal ambitions once he lost all that time. On the, on the second he did sacrifice stage. a podium stage, uh, podium on, on stage eight, was it? Um, you know, chasing he, down everything. Yeah, he, he did. But Kreuzinger sacrificed more personal results for longer than anybody else. I thought he was brilliant. But Richie end, was great, though. He, oh, absolutely. Yeah. He, Richie was the man, the domestic, who got Chris Froome the win. He couldn't have done that alone. No, I agree. No, I think yep. the best domestic was uh, Maro Quintana. He finished second. I, How good's that? How good's yeah, he's a domestic? Bad. But on the flip side, mm. he, was, he was not the domestic, okay? The best domestic potentially, well, on the podium, we've got our podium, domestic podium. <laughs> Corsica, <laughs> Port and Valverde, we, we can't that. agree on the, no. we can't agree on the order. Mm. Valverde was one of the best domestics because this guy lost, you know, 10 plus minutes, 18 minutes. He's, he would have finished second if he didn't lose that, if he didn't have that flat tyre. So he mm. went and switched roles. And he said, okay, I'm no longer able to. Nato is in with a position to get on the podium. And he took the role of captain on the road and called the shots. Do you think Cadell Evans would have been able to do that? No. And do it for TJ? No, I don't. I, I don't think very few leaders would have been able to do that. Yeah. Mm. I thought Valverde was great. Mm. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. Okay. Finally, best moment. Best moment. Well, for me, look, it's quite simple, actually. It was uh, the Orica Green Edge bus followed by Simon Gerrans finishing first on stage three, then the team time trial, back-to-back -back victories for Orica Green Edge, the yellow jersey for Gerrans, then swapping it across to, uh, to Daryl Impey. That was one of the best stories of the tour. Stage 13 crosswind was incredible, and Alpe d'Huez, there's my one moment. That's your one moment. Yeah, yeah no, that's a reasonable moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you? What was oh, your one moment? Well, I'm not as comfortable on the fence as you are. <laughs> my favourite moment was something that we didn't see and something that's been rumoured about mm. from the Spanish press. After the stage into Gap, where Contador crashed and he gave the thumbs up to Quintana as he came past, the reports are that Valverde went to the team bus, spoke to Alberto Contador and said, Alberto, a couple of points. If you've got a problem, don't do it in front of the cameras, you do it publicly. And if you've got a problem with my little Colombian mate, Nato, you've got a problem with me. And from that moment on, you could feel the tension between Valverde and Contador and Valverde roped in Rodriguez, yeah. his former roommate when they were teammates together, and Katusha and Movistar raced together from that point on to get Alberto off the, the podium. The Spanish against the Spanish, wasn't it? It was civil war and the yeah. Spanish are good at that. <laughs> the sinking of the Spanish Armada, for sure. Yeah. It was. That was the behind the scenes story, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. that, when that happened after stage in the gap, I was excited. Mm. That was something to race for. Mm. What was yours? Stage 13, hands down. That was, that Mark Cavendish was predicted to win that stage, but how that happened was completely yeah. different than we expected. I wasn't even gonna watch the stage, to be honest. 
And that, I mean, Omega Pharma. 100 kilometer lead out from oh Sylvain Chevenel. Oh my goodness, it was phenomenal. And then, yeah. and then, you know, Contador getting back time on Froome and Cavendish actually making that and th that, that split in the crosswinds. Yeah. And you're seeing guys suffer who normally don't suffer. Yeah. Completely different dynamic in a bike race that yeah. you can never really predict before it happens. You can predict the mountains, but can't, can't predict the crosswinds. Well, the, I heard that uh, Cavendish had said to Stegmans before they went into the gutter, do you think there's enough crosswind to split the, the bunch? And he said, well, I'm not, I don't think there is just yet, but before they could do anything, Martin went yeah. flat out <laughs> and just blew the race apart. So, yep, there was enough crosswind. Okay, so give us your best moments. Give us your thoughts on who was the de domestique of the tour, etc., and all the other bits and pieces that we've discussed, because next up, we're talking to Richie Port. Well, after finishing second in the race for the best domestique in the Tour de France, which Scott and Wade don't agree with me on, Richie Port joins us on the line from Europe, fresh out of bed. Richie, it was a big Tour de France for you guys at Team Sky, but for yourself personally, what was your biggest learning to come out of the race? To, to be honest, I think you learn about that every race. The, the Tour is just, it's just another race. At the end of the day, it's, okay, it's the biggest race, but I mean... It's it's just that everybody watches the tour, isn't it? It um, changes it. But look, I think I've sort of have shown now that um, you know I'm capable. <laughs> maybe down down the future with a little bit more luck and you know maybe my own opportunities, I can actually um, go for the podium in, in a, a Grand Tour. Well, Richie, uh, you've played an integral part in two Tour de France victories now. Obviously, last year, 2012, for Bradley Wiggins, it seemed to run like clockwork, and it was a very strong team that led him all the way into mm. Paris. This time, a little bit different. You know, there were some cracks in the team, cracks in pelvises as well, with uh, you know, losing a couple of riders along the way, but still got the victory. Now, you've had a little bit of time to think about it. Which one do you, uh, I guess, really look at now and think was a bigger and a better achievement? Yeah, I mean, last year, the, the only sort of bad luck we had was um, Costa Sutsu, uh crashed on the fourth stage. But the, the team that we had last year was just, I mean, such a strong team. But, um, you know, it was brilliant to win the Tour with Brad last year. But then this year, to go there with a much younger team, and, I mean, half our team did the Giro with Brad, so we couldn't use them. And, um, you know, we lost to Eddie, Edvard Bosenhagen, and then uh, Kirianka as well. And everybody questioned us. So, so to win this one, it was a, a bit different. Um, probably a little bit sweeter, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the team it was last year, but, uh, you know, Chris was absolutely fantastic and, and never buckled under the pressure. Richie, in terms of you and Chris in the room together at night, like a sleepover as teenagers, who was the rider that you spoke about the most before the light switched off? Who gave you the most concern? Yeah, obviously it sort of changed, but it, it was probably more what was Saxo Bank going to do. I mean, sometimes their tactics were a little bit unconventional, sort of, you know, attacking... Uh, you know, just attacking, uh, you know, wherever and, and uh, you know, no, it never made sense to us what they were going to do next sort of thing. But, um, you know, so obviously that with Alberto, they were trying to springboard guys up the road and, and quite often they'd do that when the break had already gone. So, um, but then eventually we saw that that was just desperation that they were doing it. So then I think... Um, it sort of went towards, you know, Quintana and then Perito Rodriguez in the last few days. They, they were the ones that were you know, going to give us the headache because, you know, Kroziger obviously was never going to attack if it was going to put Alberto in jeopardy. And to be honest, I think Kroziger was probably going stronger than Alberto. So, you know, it, it all works out in the end, though. Before we let you go, Richie, one final question on yourself. Everybody in Australia particularly is talking about Richie Port, Giro d'Italia next year. What's the program between now and getting ready to try and win your first Grand Tour? Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously I'd love to go there and, and do well, but um, for me now it's uh, I've had a little bit of a break after the tour, so I'm going to start in Colorado 
uh, did the stage race there and then Canada and then uh, hopefully be good at Worlds and, and end the season and uh, even race Tour Down Under next year for the first time in like three years so uh, I'm looking forward to you know, having a strong end of season and a uh, good break before the Giro. So Richie, non-committal about the Giro d'Italia next year, what do you think, can he win it? I think he can win it, but it really depends what Wiggins wants to do as well. They have two GC contenders and uh, definite proven ones, and Wiggins still you know, hasn't won a Giro, so he could be possibly in the middle of that. Who knows? Look, I think he can win the Giro, but I just don't think he's going to be given the chance. I think now they have a rider in Chris Froome at Team Sky that they believe can win the next three, four, five, who knows how many tours and they need Richie to play that uh, lieutenant role within the team. And if he focuses on the Giro, he might not be good enough to go on and do that uh, at the Tour de France. So, look, he learned a lot from stage on, I'm sure. Um, and he'll be a better three-week tour rider. He finished off the tour in incredibly yeah. good form, better than, than Froome on, uh, on Alpe d'Huez itself. So, uh, you know, but I think not it's on up the last the mountain stage, Sam Noz. Froome was stronger there. But anyway, yeah. we're, di we're digressing. Yeah. Richie, do you think Richie Port can win the Giro d'Italia next year? I think he can. And I think he deserves the support from the team. He's signed with Sky for two more years. But tell us what you think, because next we're going to talk about the Women's Tour de France as we catch up with Liz Heppel. Throughout this year's Tour de France, we heard a lot of discussion about a possible Women's Tour de France, which included a petition to get a Women's Tour de France back up and running. Back in 1988, an Australian by the name of Liz Heppel finished third in the Women's Tour de France. She joins us on the line. Liz, for women's cycling, if there was to be a female Tour de France in conjunction with the men's event, how do you think women's cycling would benefit overall? Uh, listen, it would be an absolutely huge benefit. The Tour de France is by far the biggest race in the world. Um, you know, it's bigger than the other Grand Tours, bigger than the Olympics. And uh, the, the profile of women to be showcased, like as I was back in 1986 through to 1988, um, riding over the second half of the men's course, um, we got uh, all the spectators, we got media coverage. They had a, a half-hour segment on TV at um, like uh, in the evening at about six o'clock at night, showcasing the women's tour with all the results, and the. The, win, the, the woman that won the Tour de France was considered to be the best in the world and the ultimate. So it was a, be, a great benefit to the women, but it was also a huge benefit to the spectators that they loved, that they absolutely loved having another tour come through and another race to watch. Well, I guess there's a, a lot has changed since 1988, or has it, I guess. You were there at the Tour de France this year with the tour group. Do you think it's feasible to be able to run the two events together? Um, listen, the Tour de France was still very, very big back in 1988. Um, you know, the spectators certainly seem to be there in, in droves. I don't think it's changed that much. Um, it was feasible back then. Um, I, I certainly think it is now. Uh, what we didn't do when I was racing is we didn't race the some of the more popular stages like Alpe d'Huez, Mont Ventoux, uh, the, the biggest stages where they have massive crowds, yes, potentially you might be able to, um, you know, not have the women run over those stages. And Liz, in one word, do you think it will happen? Um, uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe, that's a good answer. Liz, thanks for your time. No problems. So Liz was pretty honest in her assessment, maybe it will happen. If it was commercially viable, it would happen. Because ASO, who run the Tour de France, they are not a charity. So if there was money in this, it would happen. I'm of the view that the people responsible to make it happen is the UCI. Oh. And I think the example that everybody looks to is tennis. You see women's tennis and men's tennis at the four Grand Slams, and they're equal in pay and media coverage and so on. What are your, do you think it's going to happen? I think it will. I think eventually it will. And I think the pressure will become overwhelming and ASO will get on board eventually. But I do agree that the UCI need to make women's cycling more viable. And that's when all the promoters, not just ASO, will take, take a bit more interest in it. Promoters will come when the money's there. Mm. There's been examples of a lot of sports, soccer, uh, women's NBA, that have done well. Um, but the reason they've done well is because they've done something different than their male counterparts. 
And I think women cycling probably should look at doing something different because that's the way those have evolved. That's the way they've been successful. And this mistake's been made before. So I'm not so sure that this is the right way of going about it, but something has to be done. I think it is the right way for women's cycling. It would showcase them. It is the biggest platform and it would work for women's cycling. Let's see what happens. Keen to hear your thoughts. With the tour out of the way, there's that moment where you think, what next for the season? And what are you looking forward to? Well, put the question out there a little bit earlier on today, but we're gonna start with you, Wade. What are you looking forward to for the rest of the year now that the tour is done? I'm kinda, kind of done with professional cycling. I don't get into it as much at this time of year. Of course, I'm looking forward to the World Championships, but this is the time of year I get into my own cycling. I, I, I don't mind the winter and, and riding in it. And you got I'd hope so as a Canadian. <laughs> it's not so bad, actually. But you got, you got Amy's Grand Fondo coming up. You have a few other events. You've got the Melbourne Warnable. I doubt I'll do it. But, <laughs> but you've got, you got the Tour of Bright. And then it's summer, and the days are getting longer, and that's what I love about You can feel the year. atmosphere start to build Things are, at yeah. the cafe after your morning ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can see nice the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Mm. It's almost like uh, the Tour de France needs to be the last race of the year, the grand final. Well, it, it, it would be. Uh, if I, yeah, if I was yeah. the president of the UCI, which a couple of people are looking forward to, we'll get to those tweets in a moment, to restructure the season and have Vuelta Giro Tour as the crescendo would be fabulous. But anyway, that's not going to happen. What are you looking forward for to? For me, the World Championships in Florence and, and just seeing how the riders that are preparing for a one day race, be it the time trial or the road race, how they go about their preparation now. Do they do the Vuelta? You've got a few that have just done the Tour of Poland. What other races are they targeting to try and have the perfect path to be on form for that one day of the year where yeah. the rainbow bands are up for grabs? Well, Tricky Dicky agrees with you. He's looking forward to the World Championships as well. But we got a, a tweet from Aidan Holden who's looking forward to the Vuelta and the GC battle. Three Colombians, and we've seen how they've animated the Giro and the Tour so far. Plus there's a few Spaniards in there, Rodriguez and also Valverde, and you throw in Nibali. I think the Vuelta this year will be a, a beauty. I get to go there and commentate on it, I can't wait. And 11 hilltop or mountaintop finishes. Yeah, uh, it was the best. You think they're the trying best, to get some um, attention? <laughs> it was the best of the three Grand Tours last year from a sporting spectacle. Yeah, it, was. You know, it was fantastic racing. Chris Froome was given his chance after finishing second at the Tour to go for the overall. Couldn't quite nail it because he was fatigued, but uh, yeah, it was a great race. And Dwayne Cox and Thomas are looking forward to presidential change at the UCI. Do you think they're on their own? <laughs> I don't think yeah. you're on your own there, boys. <laughs> yeah, look, there's so much going on, isn't there? And there's, look, Pat McQuaid is the current president. He's looking for a position on the uh, International Olympic Committee as well. Needs to stay as the president of cycling to get that. Cycling does need a voice on the IOC as well. Um, we haven't had one for a long time and we've really copped it because of that. Um, I'm not saying Pat's the right person for it, but there's so much going on behind the scenes rather than just two guys trying to be the pres of, of the Federation. I'll tell you who is on his own. Manning Thomas is on his own. Manning's looking forward to me doing a hot lap. <laughs> it's not going to so happen. We. Yeah. yeah, it's not just you, yeah. Manning. We'd need a longer episode because it might take a fair while for me to get around the course. you got to beat Scott. Yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to the Vuelta, but I'm looking forward to the bike lane continuing. We're going to be back with more later on this year. We've got some new sponsors coming on board as well, and we're looking forward to more of your feedback. Tell us what you want to see more of in the show. Manning, I'm not doing the hot lap. Well... You go and enjoy your riding for the next few months. The weather's going to start to improve. World Championships, who's going to win? Ooh, I think uh, Valverde might be up for that. We'll talk about Alejandro a little bit later on in the next episode that we have. So stick around with the bike lane. We're going to be back later on this season. A lot more still to come on this show. Thanks again to the Northside Wheelers for hosting us. Enjoy the riding.